Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to all the international Sangha from all corners of the world. And uh, let me inform you that still the virus has not disappeared. You know that because your country is still using all those measures to prevent the vast spread of the epidemic. Our country is no exception, and I do not comment on these measures or orders or laws. In any situation, we keep a clear mind and we adjust, but we do not adjust blindly. It's very important. Do not think too much about the situation. See the situation as it is. See your correct relationship to the situation. And then act correctly. There's not much else. You may have heard that the temple is functioning even better than before because the Sangha is closer together. And yes, we do have visitors. I'm not at liberty to tell you where from, because I would break some of these rules, and I don't want to. But these visitors are very healthy, and sometimes we have 15 people in the Dharma room, sometimes even 19. It doesn't reach 20. That would be a mistake. And we are having uh, practice sessions, work, walks, everything together, simply and clearly, without any projections or any false beliefs. So more important than ever is to save yourself from ignorant views or just wrong views. More important than ever, what do you believe? Who do you believe? So if you can really trust your eyes, you can believe your eyes. If you can trust your neighbor, you can believe your neighbor. If you can trust what you hear over the television, you can believe that. But ultimately, it's only the clarity of our own mind that is the final say, whether we like it or not. So you may have heard me say that it's like a forced retreat. And take away the forced, then retreat appears. If people truly understood that the virus of impermanence is already eating us, we would all go on a retreat. Time is something you cannot fight. It eats all of us. It eats this body. It may eat our minds if we are not staying trained and clear. It's not a virus you can have just wiped out by some clever vaccination. COVID, yes, we'll get rid of it. Eventually, we will have something else to deal with. But use this time to really turn your energy inwards and deal with the questions that you have not dealt with so far. You've had your reasons, your children, your spouse, your work, everything you had to do outside to make a living. Now, most of those things outside are gone, at least suspended, maybe totally cut off. Many people are out of work, unfortunately. Find some quality time inside to deal with those questions, the real fundamentals of your life that you have not clarified yet. Other than that, there's not much else to say. The situation has not changed. Maybe you have changed in the last two weeks. Have you? Or you were just waiting for this to end? Well, don't wait. If you just wait, you may be patient. You may be uneasy. You may be anxious or even irritated. But if you react to the situation, you cannot act inside. You cannot do your job inside. So become clear. Turn your energy inside. Let your energy level increase and your mind clear. We say critical mass of don't know. All right? That's why we focus on the Tantian. We don't make anything. We don't attach to anything. We don't hold anything. We don't make anything. And we don't identify with anything. And if you can keep yourself away from the usual blah, blah of your dualistic consciousness, naturally, your energy level increases. If you practice correct meditation, it increases quicker. Just because you don't talk, you don't engage in unnecessary sensory activities. 
And when your energy level has reached a certain level and your mind a certain amount of clarity or degree of clarity, this is what we call the critical amount or threshold of don't know. Then there's a quality change. There are many fancy words for this quality change. And we don't have to use any of them. Do you see clearer with your eyes than before? Do you hear clearer with your ears than before? Are your thoughts more relevant than before? Are your emotions more refined and reflected than before? That's the question. In other words, is there a quality change in your whole being? In your mind, maybe also in your body? So look for that quality, whether there is a virus or not, whether you are forced to stay inside or you are allowed to go outside. So I'll let you ask your questions because whatever it takes, we'll get through this and in the end, you'll see the result. And this result will be yours, whether it's just doors opening, okay. Retreat inside is over, okay. And in some ways, you may thank the whole situation and if you use that you'll be grateful also you'll be grateful that it's over but use the situation correctly don't waste it don't think it's to your detriment so does anybody have any questions any kind please this is the time to ask Arpad asks, I am new to Zen Buddhism how do I get started what should I practice well Arpad in this situation I advise you to go to our homepage, zentemple.eu, download the chants and the chanting book, and chant the three short sutras every day. The Korean Heart Sutra, the Hungarian Heart Sutra, and the Great Compassion Dharani. That's every morning and evening. And then practice Zen meditation, also sitting, by watching your body posture, your breath, and asking this question, what is this? This question is directed inside. It is the source of the question itself. At every in-breath, you ask the question, what is this? I.e., what is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, thinks with my mind, feels with my heart? What is that? And ultimately, what is it that we call I in so many languages, in so many ways? Keep it simple, keep it clear. Every morning, try it with 30 minutes. And then you can do this also walking. Make up a schedule, follow it. Then meditation will begin to have positive effect on yourself. Ariella, how can I change my karma? Ariella, first you need to understand what karma is. So, I'm asking you, what is karma? Chat me a good reply. Michal, hi Sunim. Hi, Michal. What can I do with tiredness and heaviness? Heaviness is physical. You can do some exercise. Open the window, breathe in and out, do some Qigong, Son Yu, etc. That's against heaviness. Tiredness is out of your own mental exposure. Maybe a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions. You have to take care of your kids and your family then you need to find some time for yourself. I know it's difficult, but you can. Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> Nahon, as you say. That's when you really turn your energy inside. You don't talk, you do your mantra, and this multiple objects of the mind that actually makes you tired, they start to disperse, they begin to disappear. Imagine a mirror that is reflecting a thousand things at the same time. And once you do that, the reflection takes energy. If you don't have enough energy, the mirror begins to identify with the objects. The objects begin to stick. That's when you take people too seriously. That's when you react unnecessarily. If your energy doesn't get stronger, then there will be these layers of karma on top of one another. And then it will be even more tired and heavy feeling. So strengthen the mirror. Keep up the reflection. It's like your early warning system, okay? And mantras are perfect for that because they put your mind into a different gear. Once you do that on schedule, then your family will begin to respect that because they get a better mother. Your children appreciate a good mother. Your husband appreciates a good wife. Once you do that, 
then the fatigue will disappear. Shtarid, is there a way to go deeper with meditation exercising? Shtarid, if you mean meditation practice as sitting, yes, you can do it, but you don't have to change the method, just keep at it. If you mean exercise as uh, physical, then you have your trainer, personal trainer to ask. But meditation is not special. You only have to continue your practice as you used to. And if it's not established, then you need to consult your teacher about the details, set up a schedule, and then do it, do it, do it. Here in the temple, we do three times a day chanting, twice a day meditation. And if people want to have extra practice, they can do that. But without the three chants or sessions of chanting in the morning, midday, and in the evening, it would be a very different energy because we wouldn't be able to switch off our narrative. We wouldn't be able to change our minds. We wouldn't change gears. We would just be kind of hooked up on the environment, which is wonderful, but the environment doesn't make you clear. Otherwise, there would be just the Buddha's land, and then you would go there and you would get enlightenment. No. You can become clear in any kind of environment, in any kind of situation. So meditation practice has to work everywhere, anytime. That's why the method has to be as simple as possible, and the schedule unanimous. Ildiko, how can I quit being judgmental? Look at judges. Sometimes they cannot stop the judgment engine and they bring the job home. And once they do that, their family suffers. So talk to a judge. How does he or she stop judging outside of the courtroom or outside of his own or her own chambers? Step back and stop the dualistic engine that is always making good and bad. Judgment is the overdrive of uh, distinguishing consciousness. It becomes discriminating consciousness many times. That's when we pass judgment. How do you know the threshold? If you have relative values of good and bad, you make distinctions, you make assessments and suggestions. If you have judgments, then you have absolute values of good and bad. And I don't mean this as the judge's professional judgment. I mean as personal judgment when you, bad person, good person, bad situation, terrible situation, wonderful situation. So these are the judgmental kind of qualifications where you see a touch of the absolute, where this is beyond any measure, without a doubt. No one can dispute this. So when you do this, then you hit a wall. Because soon somebody will have a different judgment or will challenge you. Relative values, they tolerate challenges. In fact, they like challenges. So if you are just distinguishing, challenges are okay. Different opinions are okay. But if you're judgmental, every challenge hurts your ego. So don't judge. Distinguish. As much as necessary, sky is blue, trees are green. But the sky is not bad and the trees are not good, okay? Vera, before Corona, she says, I was always tied up and never time for anything. This time, she was sure that it would enable her to catch up. I find, she says, I am lacking behind anything, not complying with my plans. Besides being always under pressure, how can I overcome this barrier? So ambitious and such lack of energy, and I love everything I do. Beautiful. Vera, these are fantastic paradoxes, real human contradictions in one mind, in one body. Look at people around you. What happens to them when they do not fulfill the best version of their plans? And then you can see you don't want to be like that. So inside, keep your direction clear, not because you want to be better, but you would be really frustrated if you didn't use your potential to the utmost. And if it doesn't frustrate you, then maybe it's just an idea. Maybe it's just something you want, but you really don't need. Don't try to prove yourself before anyone. Not you, not other. Find out what you really want. And trust me, what you really want, you have energy for that. 
Your mind decides what you want. Sometimes our mind quality is not so good and we want stupid things. We really are ignorant about that. But you're practicing. I know you. And when that happens, you can make very good decisions. So always understand what is most important. If you find that you are kind of lagging behind or you're losing focus, come back to the question. What is most important? Good. Wonderful. <laughs> you're welcome. Art music. How to summon the muses to be creative in an inside world with meditation. Your creativity is in your mind, whether you need the muses for that or not. Usually in the human realm, a nice girlfriend works as a muse. Fantastic inspiration. Relationships are wonderful. They have a lot of energy. So use that relationship energy and you will find your muse. Ariella, finally, you got back to me. Great. Karma, you say, is cause and effect. But how can you attract to your world abundance and independence? Ariella, you want the fruit right away. So Zen is not like going shopping to your wonderful shopping mall and then you take it to your basket and then you take abundance and independence uh, to the cash desk, you pay for it and then you're good to go. Zen is not any item in the spiritual shopping mall. Zen means that you go to the garden, you plant your apple tree, and you let it grow, you care for it, and then you pick the fruit. So karma is cause and effect, you're right. Emotionally, intellectually, physically, verbally, plus all the five physical senses. Cause and effect on all these channels. Okay, the accumulation of cause and effect, the identification with the accumulation and thus the formation of your personality, personalities together like group karma. And then if you use that karma correctly, then abundance and independence will be naturally part of it. But don't want anything. If you just want something and you try to grab it, you will end up in frustration. Don't frustrate yourself. I'm practicing. I understand karma, but I don't get abundance and independence. But it's a huge step. Find out inside how you, yourself, the Ariella that you call yourself, how does she operate? How does it work? How do you create abundance? Or if there's no abundance, why? What are you saying? What are you doing? What are you thinking? That prevents you from independence and abundance in your life. So then terminate that karma and then naturally it will appear. And for that meditation is very good because your mind will really function like a mirror. You will see the cause and effect that you create. We are all responsible for the cause and effect relationship between us and the world. So what are you doing right now? What are you thinking right now? What are you saying right now? So this here and now is not a new age phrase. Zen Master Sung San used to say, you have the moment, you have everything. You lose the moment, you lose everything. Shy, only the strong survive. The lion is eating a giraffe who is eating a tree. The Americans and the Russians share the Middle East like two hungry dogs who are sharing a bleeding steak. Raw, yes. Now the COVID-19 is killing mostly old and ill people, only the strong survive. What is the origin of this pattern which defines that the strong, the healthy, the rich uh, must survive, whether this form is a virus, a nation, or the entire humanity? Shai, let me bring you the devastatingly bad news. Even the strong dies. Maybe you say that the strong one dies later than the weak. But everyone goes. The question is, what kind of role do you want to take in this matrix? Do you want to take the role of the weak or the role of the strong? Or something in between that is on the middle way, that doesn't eat unnecessarily and doesn't hunt unnecessarily, but refuses to be hunted and eaten. So there is a middle way and we can all pursue that. The strong survive, it's a, allow me to say, very Darwinistic and materialistic thing because we can be merciful, 
we can be compassionate, we can bring society up to a certain balance, a certain cohesion. We can do that so that the strong would protect the weak. And the weak would find uh, their own use, their own service to society. And once we are all useful and connected, then this thing doesn't have to happen. Otherwise, we are just animals. In the animal realm, they cannot override it. Well, sometimes you see these beautiful pictures of dogs uh, really playing nice with some small cats, okay? And they are totally symbiotic. And in the great book of life and death in the animal kingdom, this teeny little cat would not survive the touch of this huge dog. But sometimes they befriend each other. Nobody knows how, but it happens. I've seen it. It's beautiful. Check it out. It's called Minnie and Cooper. It's amazing. So the strong didn't eat the weak, but started to care for the weak and help the weak. And the weak actually became pretty strong and familiar with the dog and started to play fun and challenge. And it was always clear who is the strong. But the strong one started to use strength a little bit differently, and that didn't make him weak. So we have plenty of choice because we are humans. Fortunately or not, our choices can make us human, beyond human, below human. So how do you stay humane? Or how do you become inhuman? A dog can always behave only like a dog. But a human being can be really below the standards of a human being or actually supersede it and go beyond that. How do we do that? So what is the standard? So, oh, this was beyond human, superhuman. It was wonderful. When do we say that? Or when do we say this was so inhuman? This was below any standard. How could you do that? How could you say that? This is the question. Then the relationship between the strong and the weak, that changes. It's up to our minds how it changes, whether it changes for the better or it becomes worse. Those big nations that you mentioned and the political and financial interests involved, I don't have to comment on that. You have it everywhere in the Middle East, as far back in history as you want to go, even the Roman times. The way the province of Judea was handled is just blowing my mind. Flavius can be trusted as a historical resource and many others. There was a never a clear agreement where that land belongs and how to make peace there. The energy, unless people go there, they don't understand. The energy of that place where you guys are living and it's called so many countries uh, with an army and a navy and a holy past between three major religions. Nobody understands it unless they go there, eat falafel, some hummus, go to, you know, Jerusalem and then Haifa and maybe Beersheba, areas in between, up to the north, yeah, Rosh Pinna, check out the mountains, beautiful. But, if you don't merge with the situation, you don't attain it. And that's why those people who are controlling it from the outside, they have very bad solutions. Solutions that the locals cannot take. Zen Master Sung San had a suggestion long time ago when this uh, institution called the Vatican had a more liberal streak and uh, they were ready to talk to other religions. And he suggested that these major popes and patriarchs from all over the place, all versions of Christianity, and then the sheikhs, the mullahs, and then the rabbis, whoever is in charge of God, would meet, and for one day they would do some together action. First, they would plant a tree, then they would have lunch together, and then they would take a bath, a big hot bath together, and everybody goes home, no speeches. Just news that this happened and some pictures. This got to a certain level of the Vatican bu bureaucracy and then it died out. We never heard about it. You know, by the time I joined the school, it was over. Because that would show something different, that we are all humans. We make this world into the place that we want to make. And there are no 
big constraints that the lion is eating a giraffe because the lion is the lion and the giraffe in the giraffe. But uh, the superpowers can change policies for the better or for the worse, for more suffering or for more harmony, for happiness or for poverty. It's up to us. Avalon, the what am I question does not motivate me. Of course not. It doesn't motivate me either. Let me tell you what motivates me. When you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? Your I is not important. My I, not important. Everybody's I, my, me in the 78 varieties on screen right now is not important. But when you don't think of good and bad, when all these dualities can be taken away, then what is your original face? That original face has no I. That no I, that motivates me. That does. And maybe it will motivate you one day. I'm waiting. I work with an eight-year-old with lung cancer. We practice meditation every day together. Today he underwent surgery and removed three tumors that doubled in the past month. How else can I help him? Except for the medicine, she has nothing more to offer because chemotherapy doesn't help. So look, you can help with a wonderful, loving environment. From your message, it's clear that you're a professional, a caregiver. If you practice meditation with an eight-year-old, it's a fantastic thing, whether sick or not. Let's say that you are caring for her professionally and humanly in this way. It's fantastic. It's irreplaceable. So professional care, meditation, and lots and lots and lots of compassion. And no false words. You can love someone without lying to them. Vinetta says, because of my fault, my small fish became sick and it seems it is dying in the aquarium. I see how she's suffering and dying slowly. I think there is no hope for her to recover. I feel guilty and suffer with her. How to deal with that feeling? Vinetta, get some help for your dying little fish. That little fish is not just a little fish. It's the model for anybody dying around you. Don't watch your fish die. Get an animal doctor, replace the water in the aquarium, get her some food, chant for her, but don't just let the fish die and have this bad feeling about it. Try to help. So the correct question here is, how may I help my little fish? And then call, invite, and do something. And that's a model for your next step when somebody human is dying around you. And then you should help. So start training. Shtal read. My granddaughter is four years old. Shared her worries with me. She's afraid of being sick with the corona as well as her parents. How can I help her cope with the situation? I think you have a wonderful chance to teach cause and effect to your four-year-old. Because as a granddaughter, she listens to you. You are her granny. Grannies are wonderful. You can explain that to her, that coronas are not interested in a wonderful four-year-old granddaughters. Corona bypasses her. She just has to behave very well and everything will be fine. Corona cannot be seen, cannot be heard, but Corona is very clever. It's not coming to you unless you invite it. How other people got it, it's their problem. But if you don't take Corona into your house, then it's not going to happen. Keep the rules, be nice, everything will be fine. Adrienne. What is the view on meditating while jogging, thinking about life issues, love and work, etc.? The answer is that it's object-oriented meditation and not really meditation in terms of just thinking about it. When you stop the mind and you allow the mind to have no object and empty the mirror and attain our true nature, that's meditation. I mean, really guided towards enlightenment. And with that awakened mind, you can actually get around your problems much, much better. Yeah, you can have object-oriented meditation, but it's still not really the path that we call the utmost vehicle of Zen. We call that the outer path Zen. And that's okay, just don't confuse the two. Imiche. Restrictions on the spread of the virus strongly limit our physical movement. Meanwhile, this limitation helps expand our souls. It is said, a sound mind in a sound body. 
how can the soul soar if the body weakens because of the limitation? Look, if you have enough space for your bed, you have enough space for yoga or other types of exercise. On two square meters, you can do everything. Yes, it's limited, it's confined, it's constrained, but you can do it. Daily exercise, very, very important. You may know that we have seven hectares of land here and the forest, and I really feel sorry for those folks who are kind of tied up in the city. But if you have a few square meters, then move, move, move. That's for the exercise of the body. And then the mind should meditate, stay focused, stay clear. And that's the mind's exercise. And then you can see it on your interaction. You can see it in your relationships. If you get always stressed because it's my family for the last two months and I had no break, something's wrong. You're supposed to love your family. How does that not happen? You lose energy, you get tired, you cannot love anyone. You cannot even love your cat. And your cat doesn't even talk to you. Loving kindness patience, compassion, they take energy and they also generate energy. And don't forget that. You have to have the starting capital. You have to have enough energy to be loving, kind and compassionate. Then it happens. Then we have a sound mind. Ariella, how can I stop thinking when there is so much noise around me? Ariella, use the noise. When you really listen to the sounds of the environment, you're not thinking. That's why people go to rock concerts. They are not thinking at that time, definitely. Only bouncing and screaming before the stage. They're not thinking. So use the noise as a concert. Listen to the music of your environment. And if you do that 100%, you will not be thinking uselessly. And when you want to think, detach from the noise. Only perceive this vast empty space. And in this space, anything can appear and disappear. So if the mind has an object and you're totally merging with it, then not only your thinking doesn't exist, your own self for that duration doesn't exist because you totally became one. That's why we love actually other forms of art. Because the artistic experience totally takes you, purifies you. This purification is called catharsis in Greek. Purifies you from your thinking, from your ideas, from your notion of self. So in this case, if you don't have any artwork, use the noise. Then it will become the art of noise in your environment. Vera, what is Zen teaching on government corruption? What can we do? Vera, can you change the government? Really? Or you just go to elections three times a year, because that's what your country is doing. Yeah, I can see your smiles. You have a wonderful sense of humor, and you need it, badly. Bibi is challenging your sense of humor all the time. Can you still laugh at it? Ah, man, you have a tough job. Well, we have our own little trumpet around here, but uh, we are also very kind of talented in being humorous. Back to that, deal with any kind of inconsistency around you and inside of you. And that will help actually join hands with those folks who think like you. And then please don't make a new political party. It's very expensive. Be clear inside. Be uncorrupted inside radiate good human quality to everyone and that's the stop of corruption come on you're very well educated i know you you have seen i mean his historical perspective from various angles when was the kingdom the empire the government uncorrupted or totally pure and clear when when they will always be like that because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's not my idea. It's Lord Acton. The Brits understood the nature of their own empire, whether the sun set or did not set over it. So don't try to change something that essentially cannot be changed. Change yourself. Use this time that there is no war. There is no famine. We are not forced to migrate. People are not migrating to us. Yeah, virus is a hindrance, but still. It's peace. It's peace. That's something. But the situation on earth was never 100% correct, uncorrupted, 
or to our favor. And it will never be. This on earth will always be paradoxical, unresolved, messy, something to fight for and fight against. How do you position yourself there? So when you have time, and this is the time, find the uncorrupted inside. Find your original true nature that has no corruption or anti-corruption. Is there a difference of intention of young compared to more adult in letting go in meditation and life? Yes, Galaxy S9, there is a difference. Young is not always more foolish, but the young is ambitious. When you're young, you have more energy, you have your unresolved karma, you have your desire, you have what you want, and by the time you get old, you either got it or you realize that you never will because time just went by. So with meditation, the elder, they might have more wisdom. But if they don't start when they are young, their minds are not trained. And when you live your first 40, 50 years of your life without meditation, it's really hard to get accustomed to it. So best to start when you are young, by some miracle. And if you do that, then you train yourself, you live your life, and when you get older, you already have something to rely on. You can use your meditation experience. And if you get a good teacher, that teacher will make it very clear that meditation doesn't mean that you do not live your life. That you don't have your spouse, your work, your children, whatever you want, whoever you want. But it means that you do it clearly, that you do it selflessly, that you do it with wisdom and compassion and help. So the quality changes. And if you change the quality, then necessarily the quantity will also change. If you know how to make a choice and you take the right product, you don't have to buy five of the same kind because you have only one and that one will suit you. This life is only one. Make it worthwhile. This face looking at me, this mind chatting to me, there will not be another life. We have only one, this one. So value it, and of course, when you're young, you have your young desires, old, old desires, but meditation is necessary and useful in all kinds of ages, every single moment. Esti, hi. Some people that I work with look for instant solution in order to have a relief these days. They ask for me to help with meditation materials. What do you advise me to do? Bring them instant coffee in a pouch we call two in one because sometimes cream is added and sugar so they should have that as a relief if they want something instant if they are really interested in the teaching then they should put down instant or gradual then they should put their question to the right place so first of all instant solution you say that means that implies that they have a problem and if they have a problem, there's a cause to the problem, an end to the problem, and a way to end it. So start with the Four Noble Truths if they are interested. If they are too impatient, coffee. The problem is that coffee will make them even more impatient, so be careful. Seagal, how can I stop the inside noise slash thinking? Shout, Seagal. Shout, then the noise of the shout will be bigger and stronger than your thinking. And if you cannot shout, towards the outside because they would call the police or the ambulance or both, then inside mantra. Mantra is taking away the unnecessary noise of the mind. Then don't worry about this calm, clear spaciousness that appears. I deliberately do not call this emptiness, okay? It's not empty. It's complete, but there is no object in it. You are one with the world without a sense of I. Nothing is missing, but there's nothing there that you can call yourself. So let the noise go back to silence. Or shout bigger, your choice. Moti. How can I meditate when I am experiencing anxiety that comes and goes even when I'm sitting in meditation and I doubt what I sense? Moti, do not doubt what you sense, but just don't attach to it. Don't identify with it. Don't make an opinion on it. If you sit and something happens like a bird passes and chirps, don't doubt that. It's the bird chirping. 
That's all. Don't think it's good or bad, disturbs you or helps you. It's just the bird coming by and said, that's it, done. Anxiety, that's what makes us meditate. Don't think it's a hindrance. Anxiety makes you ask this question, what is it that makes me shake and tremble? Anxious, irritated, what is that? So the clash of the world and yourself, boom, it forces us to do something. Astrid, how to deal with rejection? Astrid, I reject your question. Happy? I don't think so. Rejection sometimes is necessary. If you're rejected by someone, thank you very much, I have nothing to do with you. Then you find someone who doesn't reject you and you don't reject that person, done. If it's work-related, it's more complicated. Then you really have to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the boss. Making mistakes makes me feel guilty. That's from Galaxy S9. That's a very typical human reaction. But I'd like to suggest that you look at the two extremes. One is the guilt trip. The guilt trip is something that you can get lost in. I'm guilty. I'm making mistakes. I'm making mistakes all the time. I'm guilty, so please pay attention and help me and love my guilty self because I am so guilty that I need you. I need you to share this guilt with me. Maybe you are my savior, you are my accomplice, it doesn't matter. But please, I'm guilty, so pay attention to me. Ultimately, this guilt trip turns into a very, very nasty and smart ego. Why is this a problem? Because if you have a guilt trip, inherently, you refuse to correct your mistake. Why? Because it would make the whole trip disappear. You wouldn't attract attention. You would just become a normal human being. So feeling guilty, identifying with your mistake, attaching to your mistake and making an I, a self out of it is a huge mistake. Don't feel guilty. Correct the mistake. The other extreme is being totally ignorant and uh, careless and say, what? Mistake? Who cares? It will disappear. No, no, no. If you made a mistake, you correct it. So one extreme, total guilt, absolutely fake. Total ignorance, absolutely unacceptable. So find a middle way, see the fact of the mistake, not the way you want to see your mistake, but as it is, as you caused it, as it happened in other people's minds also. Find the cause, find the end, find a way to end it. That makes you into a mature human being. J.S. Wu, hi. Recently, tremendous rage arises in my mind quite frequently. Listening to Dharma talks, meditation, bowing, help soothe this rage, but it always comes back quite immediately. It always returns and I agonize and I'm consumed by it. While being consumed by rage, I blame governments, stupid leaders, the old generation's numb way of life, etc. I get furious over something that I cannot do anything about. Only after it totally consumes me, I feel that this process of my mind was totally unnecessary. How can I deal with this rage coming back? Wu, consume the rage. Use the rage against itself. It's really cannibalistic. If you use the rage to eat the world, you die, your world dies. Use the rage to eat itself. We call that mind fasting. You deprive yourself of anything that you can be angry about or you can feel any rage about because that's not you. So ultimately you are the source of this anger and you have said that, that's wonderful. But even this anger is not you. You are the source, you manufactured it. So use the rage to eat the rage, to consume it completely. And then you stop generating it because ultimately you can destroy yourself. No matter how angry you are at these things and institutions and phenomena that you described, in fact, your angry energy supports them, whether you like it or not. In fact, some of these entities that you mentioned, they deliberately challenge you and try to make you angry because that anger is a benchmark. How can these entities make you angry? What is it? Don't let that happen. 
Don't be controlled by it. If you control rage, then you know when to display it and when not. And 99.9% .9 of the time, we don't display that because it's plain wrong. It's just causing more suffering, more anger, even more suffering, etc. You cannot change the karma of the old generation. We are their children. Some of you are already fathers and grandfathers. So what kind of generation are you? Will your children and grandchildren call you dumb? What are you doing right now? What do you bequeath to them? What is your heritage? So think about that. And then this destructive rage turns into creation and something more positive. For that, you have to be able to put that rage down completely. So once you see how self-consuming anger becomes, you can totally return to the source of that anger to point zero before that anger appears, before your reaction prompts this tank division and armored brigades trying to destroy everything and everyone you don't like. And then once you see the source of the anger, you can control it. And then you can make a decision, manifest it or not. Transform it into some kind of productive thing because desire is the opposite of anger or not. Even more advanced, you can also see how desire is thwarted and frustrated and turns into anger. And anger is soothed and there's a wise angle of view on it and it turns into desire. So how does that happen? How do these transformations and changes of polarity happen? Put a plant in your room. Your wall is very white. Your room is very empty. So have something nice and friendly, like a living being there. Yeah, even up there on your ceiling, there's nothing. Maybe just the light. So try and get some plant, a dog, a cat, or a girlfriend into the room, and then you won't feel lonely. Ariella. Can consciousness develop even without meditation practice? Yes, Ariella, it can develop. We call that the speed of sensory perceptions and dualistic processes. And that's very slow. You can see that over the centuries that humanity as a species didn't really understand that war doesn't make peace. Trying to conquer nature means we are destroying ourselves. These equations didn't go through. So just going with the speed of sensory perceptions and dualistic realizations through the thinking mind, the emotional intelligence, etc. We call that sensory speed. So that's the speed of development. And the problem is that we procreate faster than this development could actually teach us, i.e. we could teach ourselves as a species what is correct. Because our grandfather's wisdom is dead with them, mostly. So that's why this realization, what we call mental speed, that happens with meditation, an increased energy of realization, reflection, and enlightenment, that's our chance to do it fast enough so that we could impart it to the next generation. Hey, learn from this. Try and follow this, then your quality of life will be different. Your relationship will be different. You will act, speak, etc. differently. You will leave a different earth behind. But unfortunately, even this is not enough. If you look at the nearly 8 billion human beings on this planet, we produce suffering way faster than we produce enlightenment. So our quality is lacking and our quantity is spreading. That's the problem. If we don't increase our quality, we will automatically, inevitably reduce our quantity. And that's why meditation practice is inevitable and indispensable if we want to develop quick enough to prevent even bigger disasters from happening. Michela, wearing jewelry, makeup and nice clothes, is it a sign of ego? No, not necessarily. I have seen big egos without jewelry, makeup, and nice clothes. And I have seen totally selfless people where these women looked wonderful and beautiful with all the makeup, jewelry, and nice clothes. And they were like bodhisattvas. It's your heart that decides. So have the courage to look beautiful, but also have the wisdom to help this world.
and then your compassion will outshine any jewelry. All right? Ildiko, how can I recognize what I created in my mind? Well, Ildiko, your mind manifests and it interacts with the world. So if you're upset, then your relationships will notice that. If you're happy, your relationships will give you adequate feedback. Your mind's creation is hitting the world, touching the world. How? Depends on the quality that you created. Yael. I practice not to be attached to my feelings, cognition, thoughts, ideas, etc. But then I become attached to the practice itself because when I'm less practicing, I feel the influence on me. I think you mean karma. So the attachments to something is always there. Is it possible to be without attachments at all? Attachments as a hindrance? We don't want that. Relationships where we are loyal, when we are totally kind of helpful to our family and our family is helping back to us, whether it's a flesh and blood family or Sangha, we need that. Attachments become a hindrance when it's not your choice. So when we meditate, we put everything down. That's why I say, put it all down. No ideas, no thinking, no emotions, no attachments. Don't hold, don't make, you know the drill. But once the mind becomes clear, you recognize your choices. And your choices make you into a mother, a wife, a partner, a student, a Dharma teacher, etc. These are not attachments, these are commitments. So where you feel that your relationship has commitment, it's something you did. Something you committed to, someone you engaged with, etc. This kind of attachment doesn't feel like a burden. Because it was intentional, it was conscious, it has its own benefits, etc. Well, you can say not always. But still, those commitments are better teachers than those attachments where you feel imprisoned. Where you are attached to some idea or something from the past that you cannot change. It is possible to be without any attachment, yes, up on the mountain. And you put everything down, you became a monk or a nun, and then you can put everything down, and yet you have the Sangha you support, the teacher you listen to, and the Dharma you follow. These are not attachments. These are 100% commitments because you can come and go at any time. I got uh, thank yous from Vera, Shimon and Galaxy S9. All of you are welcome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that Vera's dog is very happy. The little white puppy that I have seen so many times. I hope also Benny is happy. Thank you for uh, paying attention and uh, being with all of us. Please keep up the good work of using this time correctly meditating, attaining clarity, and saving this whole world from suffering. Thank you very much. See you soon.